Welcome to the Your Pennsylvania Ancestors podcast. This is Denise Allen. Thank you for joining me for part three of our special episodes on ancestor stories. And today we're also going to talk about newspapers and how to go deeper into your ancestors' lives using those. In this episode of the Your Pennsylvania Ancestors podcast, we hear what it was like to live through the yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia from Lauren Pegdal of indianahistory.org. Lauren shares how the similarities in that epidemic really parallel what we're going through with the coronavirus pandemic today. Then I'll share where and how you can access digitized newspapers to get more historical context when researching your ancestors. And now, here's Lauren. Lauren, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Could you introduce yourself to everyone and say a little bit about your background and how you got started in genealogy? Right, um, so my name is Lauren Pichtel, and um, my family is from dead center of the state of Pennsylvania. Um, and we have almost all of my family lines have been in central Pennsylvania since at least 1750, um, almost every single one of them within about the same three counties. Um, so I have very deep central PA roots. Um, and my current job with the Indiana Historical Society in Indianapolis, Indiana, where I'm the manager of family history and cultural programs and spend a lot of time um, working with genealogists to teach our guests all sorts of great skills. And I'm also co-chair for the Midwestern Roots uh, Family History Conference as well. You and I connected because we're talking about stories of our ancestors and how those stories help us through the time that we're experiencing right now. So we're in this time of upheaval and, you know, we really don't know like what's going to happen next. And what story do you have from your past that you'd love to share with people? This is about my sixth great grandmother, uh, Rebecca Smith Blodgett. Um, so as a family historian and storyteller, I focus on the experience of my ancestors. I want to discover what filled their closets and dining room tables, what books were on their shelves and in their minds what music filled their rooms, what tunes they hummed while walking, and what styles and fabrics brushed their skin. When we move past these physical experiences, we can explore the social, moral, and ethical questions that plague them at night. And so with my position with the Indiana Historical Society, this is the style of research I encourage of our guests. And in line with our mission to be real storytellers of our collective and personal histories, this style of research powerfully breaks past the limits of our own research styles, focuses on a specific moment in time, expands past traditional genealogical records and methods, and really begins to imagine what a person was truly experiencing. These details are vital to set us on a path of captivating storytelling and to connect the listener of today to the stories of the past. So while working on the detailed research of my sixth great-grandmother, Rebecca Smith Blodgett, in the fall of last year, my father reminded me of her and her mother's brush with the yellow fever epidemic of 1793 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I dove into Philadelphia resources, the diary of Elizabeth Drinker and accounts from Dr. Benjamin Rush and Rebecca's father, the Reverend Dr. William Smith. While yellow fever and the novel coronavirus are vastly different diseases in presentation, cause and spread, the similarities in these experiences of the people struck a really strong chord with me. One evening a month ago, I returned to the letter that the Reverend Dr. William Smith wrote his great friend, Dr. Benjamin Rush, one of the leading physicians caring for the sick at the time. He wrote about his family's loss and, had, and I had to take a pause as the grief and fear of the unknown moving forward is definitely a strong and shared sentiment we all have today. This letter to Rush is full of emotion, even to where Reverend Smith says he cannot relay his emotions to anyone else as they are dealing with their own grief of their mother and his beloved wife. He describes his wife's depression over the loss of all her intimate friends, watching their funeral possessions from her window, 
she followed them down all the streets to the graveyard as far as she could see. He goes on to say, beyond the few days required for him to put his own affairs in order, he doesn't care too much about what happens to his own health after her death. The emotions of then and today are similar. We are unable to attend loved ones' funerals, to mourn together or celebrate together. Smith describes that at the time of his wife's burial, it was only him and Richard Allen, founder of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, present to mourn her death. We contemplate and plan for our own mortality now. It's all around us. We're scheduling meetings with lawyers to upgrade our wills, and we're discussing our own burial plans. As the fever began, William and his wife entered the Christchurch graveyard and picked out their own plots. There was a stipulation about once someone was buried, that area could not be opened for a second burial. So they picked out their plots separate from each other, where she was next to children who passed on previously, struck a deal with one another, and went to the grave digger to make sure that this pattern was followed. We saw businesses closed on social media, and we see worship ser services shift to virtual meetings. In 1793, the newspapers are littered with ads about closing church doors and coffee shops, sermons, and newspapers. We look to industries that seem to be crumbling today and wonder what would be left in a year's time. And just like then, the fear of another summer of yellow fever or when the historic second wave of coronavirus will hit keeps us up at night. We think, was the quarantine enough? Even in all of this uncertainty, fear, and grief, I find comfort, comfort in some other similarities of the yellow fever, the 1918 flu epidemic, and the coronavirus today. There will always be selfless heroes there to help and physicians to guide. Dr. Benjamin Rush and John Devise didn't have all the answers and had two pretty different ways to treat patients. And like today, these leaders are both heroes and targets. They advised with what they knew and constantly studied to improve. Reverend Smith, Bishop White, Absalom Jones, Richard Allen, and other leaders of faiths had the opportunity and means to leave the disease ravaged inner city of Philadelphia, but they chose not to, to stay behind and offer their services in any way they could, knowing what could be the cost of that decision. And to William Smith, it was his wife. Today, we see our family, friends, and neighbors in the healthcare field facing unprecedented risk, exhaustion, and mental challenge to care for our most treasured soul. And there will always be disappointment. The population response to panic, the unknown, the fear, and what people do with all those emotions. In 1793, this led to husbands and wives abandoning one another, children being left behind to fend for themselves in the street couples both perishing after nursing one together, and this is not unlike things we are seeing today. These experiences remain, but change due to, due to decisions to host parties or other gatherings and a risk for what could, that could mean in future weeks. As we shift into our different phrases of reopening, I'm often reminded of these decisions. We see the isolation, distance, and melancholy these diseases plant in our minds. While today we experience folks fleeing New York City for the countryside of Pennsylvania, many Philadelphians did the same. Citizens of means retreated to properties outside the city limits or friends and family scattered around. It's estimated that a third of the population of Philadelphia left. For me, the stillness and em emptiness it, it stores was the most uncomfortable. Rush hours in my city, Indianapolis, stopped. Being in downtown at 5 p.m. with wide open streets was eerie. Reporter Fenno commented of the, 19, or the 1793 fever, the city is now in a manner depopulated. Business is in a great degree stagnant. Business of every kind became suspended and universal stillness prevailed night and day. Philadelphia residents made this social isolation the norm. There are many other instances of the experiences of my family story and the experiences of Philadelphia in 1793 that parallel the feelings and attitudes of today. And while that is currently so overwhelming and negative at times, and we are still looking into a very scary and, un and future unknown, I find comfort in studying these experiences and knowing what came after. 
We hold our family and friends closer. We create and invent and we build until the next fever comes. Wow. It's hard to believe Philadelphia came back from that. I mean, we all did. Right. You know, I mean, I, I just. Well, it's also like they lost 8% in death. And that's it's a lot when it's not a very high population. I think the population at the time was around 50,000. Yeah. And they don't even know um, the true death number because of all the different ways of burial registers and everything. And, right. And today I'm also struck by the not much has changed in 220 years. In 1793, the idea was that African Americans could not contract yellow fever. <laughs> and they were put um, in charge of burials and details for funeral services. And that was obviously not the case. Um, and now we look to today in the very um, disproportionate numbers of deaths and how some politicians are just okay with that. So, yeah. so if there was a, a piece of advice uh, Rebecca would share or your family would share to all of us, what, what do you think they would tell us? Her father, William Smith, um, was a very devout Christian. Um, I myself am not really, don't really practice in religion, but um, if, if William Smith were to comment about this, reading some of his sermons um, in response to the yellow fever um, and some of his sermons and just conversation with Rush about his grief, um, I think from the mouth of, mouth of William Smith, it would be to hold fast in your faith or whatever goodness and kindness that you believe in. Um, for myself, that turns into just believing and looking to the kindness in humanity. Um, I had to actually turn off my social media for a period of time and take it off my phone during all of this um, because one, it's just a lot with negativity and differing people's values on what were happening just really got to me, especially as a person who's a very strong empath. <laughs> I think for me, it's just you and the lovely Mr. Rogers, like you have to look for the people who are always doing good. Um, that this too will, shall pass and keep yourself safe and do what you need to do to keep your loved ones safe. Well, Lauren, th thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing that story. Uh, where can people f follow up with you or touch base with you, follow the work that you do? Because you do do fantastic work. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I work with the Indiana Historical Society. So if you jump onto www.indianahistory.org, um, we have all sorts of great uh, virtual services that you can check out. Um, right now, we're recording what we call History Happy Hour every Thursday from 5.30 to 6.30. So you can grab your favorite beverage um, and join us as we talk with one of our colleagues or professionals in the field. Um, last, on, last week, we talked about um, historic underwear through the ages. <laughs> and uh, this week, we are chatting um, with about Star Jeanette Recording Studios, which is the cradle of recorded jazz in Indiana. Um, but I'm off also offering a lot of great family history workshops um, during this time and great ones coming up throughout the year. You can donate um, to the IHS so we can continue to do this great work and offer great programs to anyone across the country. Um, and if you check out our calendar of events, you'll see all the great stuff coming up. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you again to Lauren for composing such a thoughtful reflection on one of Pennsylvania's earliest disease outbreaks. It's a reminder to me that history occurs more like cycles than a straight linear progression, and that I can always learn from the past, no matter what the topic. In the previous episode of the podcast, I shared how to access the personal papers of our ancestors through archives. But what if you want to know what is going on in the community as a whole? Well, Pennsylvania has a rich history of newspaper publishing across all the counties of the state, 
And each of these papers provides us a peek into the life of that community. Pennsylvania's most famous newspaper is the Pennsylvania Gazette, started by Benjamin Franklin in 1727. And if you go to newspapers.com, they have the paper digitized there, and you can read it anytime you want in the comfort of your home. But honestly, the best part of digitized newspapers for most of us is using them as a substitute for vital records and finding obituaries for, you know, people all over the country. They're very searchable because of the optical character recognition or OCR technology. Unlike handwritten records, which have to be indexed by individuals doing the reading of the original and then typing up what they see, OCR uses the shapes of the printed words on the page to find the words that you're looking for. You simply type into that search bar and the OCR translates it into what the words would look like in that edition of the paper. So where do you find Pennsylvania newspapers? Well, of course, you know about newspapers.com. A lot of people use that. And there's also genealogybank.com and chroniclingamerica.com. I have links to all of those in my show notes, and they're all excellent places to start. But did you know that there's more newspapers digitized for your research? One of the places you can find digitized newspapers is actually at Penn State University. They have a collection for free that you can access. And there are a lot of the smaller run newspapers and very local ones, which I know every genealogist is looking for because a lot of times those are our hardest to find ancestors. The State Library of Pennsylvania also has digitized some newspapers. You'll find those at the Power Library website, and I have a link to that in my show notes too. The State Library will also send you the microfilm reels of the newspaper to your local library anywhere in the United States. So as your library opens up and you're able to talk to them, go through the library catalog for the state of Pennsylvania and look to see what they have. And you can request up to five microfilm reels. Now, it's not digitized, so you're not going to have that thrill of the uh, OCR search. But if you know you want to do some historical research on your ancestors, having access to the newspaper is just very exciting and better than nothing. Um, Also, check in with the local historical and genealogical societies in the state. Many of them have microfilm also of the local newspapers and are willing to do lookups for you. And sometimes they've already done indexing of obituaries and will know exactly the edition to go to if you want one for your ancestor. No matter what newspaper you're searching or no matter what community in the state, take time to read the editions around significant events, either significant events in your ancestor's life or significant historical events. For instance, what was the community talking about at the end of the Civil War? How did the community celebrate July 4th or New Year's Eve or Christmas or Easter? Or was there another holiday that they celebrated? Each community in the state had different cultural traditions and different opinions of current events. Taking the time to read the newspapers for where your ancestors lived will help you understand what they were experiencing and what their concerns were. It's possible that what you were taught in history class isn't exactly the way that your ancestors believe things. And getting to know your ancestors at this deeper and more complex level will give you ideas on where to look next for records for them. And if nothing else, it'll give you an appreciation that history is not as simple as we've always been led to believe. I want to thank you for listening to our special three-part episode on ancestor stories and getting to know your ancestor stories through journals, letters, diaries, and newspapers. Next week, I'm going to share how this 14 days of journaling about current events in 2020 has helped me with my research of my ancestors. I've had some real breakthroughs and I'm eager to share those with you next week on the podcast. I'll also answer some listener questions that have come in through my website. This is Denise Allen of PAAncestors.com. Thanks again for listening and I hope your family and community are safe and healthy. Thank you.